Hello and welcome all to the third event in the Fall 2022 Barbara and David Zelaznik Reading Series. My name is Valjina Mort and I'm happy to host tonight's event at Cornell University, located on the traditional homelands of Cayuga Hono. The Cayuga Hono are the members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six foreign sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Cayuga Hona dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Cayuga Hona people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Uh, the Creative Writing Series is made possible through the ongoing generosity of Barbara and David Zelaznik. And uh, tonight we have the Richard Cleveland Memorial Reading and a Richard Cleveland Memorial Endowment was created in 2002 by family, friends and alumni in memory of Richard Cleveland, Cornell class of 1974, accomplished poet, writer and naturalist. Uh, check out our website. We have one more event left uh, this semester. Um, so sign up for our um, e email letter uh, so that you do not miss it. Uh, the reading will be followed by a live interview. That's why these two chairs are here. Um, and um, we hope to have time for a brief Q&A after the interview, after the conversation. As always in the best tradition of these events, immediately following the reading, there will be a book signing and reception with light refreshments. Upstairs in the English lounge, everybody who is here is welcome and invited to come and partake and um, meet our poet personally. Please take this moment to turn off your phones and devices. Last time, during the second reading, I asked you to do it and one person did not do it. <laughs> so if you're right now trying to pretend that you do not own a phone, because you are that alternative, you do have a phone, please turn it off. There are poets whose biographies begin long before their birth. I can say that Sandeep Parmar was born in Nottingham in the fam family of Punjab Sikh refugees and was raised in California, but that won't be enough. A French writer, Marguerite Duras, warns whoever attempts to tell a simple story. Writing isn't just telling stories, it's exactly the opposite. It's telling everything at once. It's telling of a story and the absence of a story. It's telling a story through its absence. And I struggled with my microphone to embody <laughs> the difference of this telling. In this case then, um, I'll say that a poet, Sandy Parmar, was born long before Nottingham. She's already born in 1947 for the partition of Punjab to watch her grandfather stand on the rooftop of his house watching how fire swallows his farm fields. She's already born in the 60s when her grandparents transformed from once British subjects into refugees into Britain. When a girl of 14 in her grandmother's haunted sitting room, she reads Homer listening to Vivaldi, she discovers that she might have been as well alive for centuries. Antiquity, just like the Western world that inherited it, appeared to her as a buffed up version of heroism a civilization modeled on the narratives of exploitation and silencing of women. As Virginia Woolf puts it, our civilization is a narratological failure. To address this narratological failure, Sandeep Parmar decides to study literature. She returns to the UK where she receives her May at the University of East Anglia in Norwich at the desolate end of a train line, as she gives directions to, to it in one of her interviews. And then she goes to get her PhD from the University College London. A young poet who wants to tell everything at once, a young poet who wants to tell the story of absence, 
She wonders if the British lyric mode, mode she describes as the mode of white male epiphanies, has any place for her. At the time, Parmar saw two camps in the British tradition. On the one side, an avant-garde poetry that relished post-identity literature, evading the actual lived experience of difference. On the other hand, a mainstream lyric mode that normalized difference by fetishizing poets for universal reader. In her landmark essay, Still Not a British Subject, Race and UK Poetry, she challenges the way former colonial subjects are marketed for the poetry by the poetry industry and for the poetry industry as exotic objects rather than equal cultural citizens. Parmar doesn't want to tell a marketable colonial story. She wants to tell the absence of the story, to address the neurotological failure of this absence. Her research interests are the absent modernist women, as well as the absent conversation about contemporary poetry and race. I don't like this microphone. <laughs> Can you hear me well? Is that a little bit better? Well, um, So her research interests are the absent modernist women, as well as the absent conversation about contemporary poetry and race. So she confronts this absence with her work. Her scholarly books include reading Mina Loy's autobiographies, Myths of the Modern Woman, scholarly editions for Carcanet Press of the collected poems of Hope Murray's, Murley's and the collected poems of Nancy Cunard. Her essays and reviews appear in The Guardian, The Los Angeles Review of Books, The New Statesman, The Financial Times, and The Times Literary Supplement. She is a BBC New Generations thinker and a co-director of Liverpool Center for New and International Writing. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. In 2017, she co-founded the Ledbury Poetry Critic Scheme for poetry reviewers of color a landmark program that revolutionized the way poetry and criticism are discussed and written in the UK. We have been extremely lucky this semester. Uh, we've enjoyed the company of one of the greatest literary thinkers of our time, Sandy Parmar, a visiting poet to our creative writing program here at Cornell, an artist of poetic complexity and linguistic difficulty. Her work moves between lyric and experimental modes, retaining a deeply intellectual authority over itself against the poetry of coherence, against ready-made meaning. Sandeep Parmar is a poet with an intellect like a tightened bow. Her mind's instrument is an unacknowledged light applied at an impossible angle. Her poetry illuminates what she herself describes as the spectral nature of unrecorded and suppressed narratives scapegoated for the greater purposes of citizenry, national building, and global dominance. This word, spectral, ghostly, shadowy, haunts all three of her poetry books. The Marble Orchard, opens with the whispers of women in corded rooms and the glows beneath doorways. This book is indeed a chaotic archive of women, a plague of aunties, witches, fates, ghosts, scapegoated mothers and grandmothers inflicted with children next to avant-garde women poets and ancient eidolons. What glows beneath the doorway in that opening to her first book is not only memory, not only archival fever, but also the city of Troy burning in her second book, Eidolon. Also, what's burning there is the light in Faust's workshop on through the night. In Faust, her third book. In all three books, also and always, 
The women whisper about blood, progeny, primogeniture. In Faust, the corded rooms of the marble orchard become the rooms marked empty in the revelatory and heartbreaking miscarriage poems. Also and always, in all three books, glowing beneath the doorway, beneath the bottom of the page, are the farm fields in Punjab. Like all great poets of obsession, Sandeep Parmar never climbs down the rooftop where her grandfather stands in 1947. At the center of this new book, Faust, a book we get to welcome here at Cornell and celebrate its arrival, is a sequence of strikingly elliptical poems of family history linked to Goethe's Faust through the word striving, to strive, a word often used approvingly for the right sort of immigrant. For Parmar, the modern day Faust is neither a scholar academic nor Elon Musk type, but a migrant who flees a post-colonial legacy of fire, displacement, and climate destruction for a life of eternal striving. Parmar's description of migrant experience is haunting. Boxes were half of everything we owned. She writes in Faust. In Marble Orchard, she writes, we arrived when one, with one steel pot, a bag of lentils, and an onion. And this onion harvested in the Marble Orchard in the first book is planted here in Faust in this third book. These potatoes, these onions, I have planted for centuries and you bring me Englishman for a husband. <laughs> All three books are full of marriages, centuries of arranged marriages that bring uprootings, families to whom one is infinitely wifed, talks of fertility. The preface to Eidolon um, is an excerpt from Hart Crane's poem, Marriage of Faustus and Helen, a marriage that takes place in Goethe's Faust, of course. So the preface to the second book uh, serves as a prophecy for the third book in which this marriage actually happens and is described. With the arrival of this third book, Faust, the spectral quality of all of these characters forms into a spectrum, an arch of a rainbow. What we have here, I would propose, is a triptych a bold and innovative exploration of history, exile, memory, racism, and culture in three volumes. Each volume begins with an invocation. Each one is full of spells, curses, chants, as family history throws its chaotic waves onto the impenetrable walls of mythological and mythologized narratives. There's also a lot of humor in the way that Sandeep Parmar tackles patriarchal expectations. He has one moment where a mother, I assume, speaks, and I would like to use it to close my introduction and welcome her on the stage. This is what the mother says. When my husband's sisters wept because I had no sons, I said, I have two daughters one of body, the other of mind, and sent my uterus via Federal Express to the village with my compliments. With my compliments to our Cayuga village, via Cornell Express, doctor of mind, Sandeep Parmar. Okay, hopefully you can all hear me. Hi, everyone. If you can't hear me, just wave. You're waving? Okay, you can't hear me. Thank you so much, uh, Valjina, for that amazing uh, introduction and for your very careful um, and just brilliant readings of my work. I'm very grateful. Um, today, I will read from a bit from all three books, um, but I'll just read one poem from the first book. 
Um, and it's a, it's a book that was accumulated over many years um, and therefore is a, a series of kind of discontinuous things. But, um, and I wasn't going to read from it, but today uh, in class, um, the creative writing undergraduates that I'm teaching, um, we discussed the Ghazal. And uh, a Ghazal is actually, uh, it's a really, I'm sure it's a form that many of you are familiar with, but um, it's uh, the only traditional form that I've ever written in. Um, and I think it's going to stay that way. Um, and this poem is, is for them and for their assignments, which they are, of course, all writing a gazelle now. Against Chaos. Love could not have sent you in this shroud of song to wield against death your hollow flute tuned to chaos. Whatever the ancients said, Matter holds the world to its bargain of hard frost, but life soon forgets chaos. He who has not strode the full length of age has counted, then lost count of days that swallow like fever dark chaos. And you, strange company in the back seat of childhood, propped on the raft of memory like some god of chaos, you threaten to drown me wind through palmed streets, oracle of grief. The vagrant dance of figures in chaos, carting trash over tarmac. Stench of Popeye's chicken, the Capitol Records building, injecting light and chaos into the LA sky. That paper boat in rainwater rushing dives out of my reach, and old women give no order here to chaos, nor calm with their familiar tales. Your voice follows me into and out of the wrong houses, riding my heels in chaos, as if to say that every half-remembered element I forged in glass is only the replicate dying shadow of love's chaos that once spoken is like a poison dropped in the mouth of song, turning it dolorous and black. I have eaten this chaos, its paroxysm of birth, and seen it uncoil from the faces of loved ones into sickness and distance and loss. Chaos that hounds, that drums its fingers on the window like rain, who will not forget me and permit me to reach across 30 years for the child peering out over the very same landscape day after day yellowing day, that day of chaos, where you are still sounding your warning, though I was too young, to be left with the bitter heaviness of song, it's chaos. As Valgina mentioned, um, <clears throat> Eidolon is, um, is a kind of spectral figure. Um, and it refers to a sort of theory around what happened to Helen of Troy um, when, uh, when uh, the Trojan War began. Uh, quite possibly she was there, quite possibly she was not. Um, and what was left in her place was this kind of ghostly figure. So I like this kind of presence and absence of her. And the book is written in a series of um, poems that are continuous, so I'll just sort of pick through them. Um, and some of them are kind of in her voice and others are elsewhere. It was not me, but a phantom, whose oath a variable star moldering in the reliquary is doubt. I have not unsealed love, its taproot, mouthing blackness, nor seized the fairer woman to purge from her her song. This hell house of primogenitor, bookish and pale, quartering what is also its own and only rule, this fire and the fire that comes from fire. Helen dispirited, camera bound. Helen fetching the paper from the front lawn in her dressing gown a lot of the time and knowing when the phone will ring seconds before by the click of its current Demi-goddess, not woman, not god, disembodied like a bowl turned over and its loaf thumping out. Helen, queen of never mind the time, of you can't run on gin for all the everlasting. And such, moths broiling airlessly in a sodium bulb, 
smell of it on her front porch, lights on, home. Waking to a November morning, to pins running across a yardage of wool or headaches, the circular world disfigured by food, corn cobs in the sink gleam like teeth up her spine. Hurry up, the bus goes, and its deshabillement goes, loaming on after it. I do not insist that we retain the old names. I would know you ever light as the seed. Marketing the day-long detente for a sliver of profit does not appear to bother the kingdom of saints. Ascetics, her brothers, Spartans, whose only God is, insert here, the death of 11 days. Wash the man by the road who turns and seeing or not seeing is soundless animal. Wash him. He is your brother. Enter his encampment of fuel-scarred fabrics and listen to his black pronouncements, void of exhaust. Scramble up the highway's escarpment in violet good. Wash him or be without brothers. U.S. national interests. Matters of vital interest to the United States to include national security, public safety, national economic security, the safe and reliable functioning of critical infrastructure, and the availability of key resources. PPD, Presidential Policy Directive, 20 Top Secret. It has, of course, occurred to me that this conversation is being recorded, but what you say does not anyway belong to me. The 1913 local prosecutor training manual warns, no Jews, Negroes, Dagos, Mexicans, or a member of any minority race on a jury, no matter how rich or well-educated. The 1986 manual warns against those with multiple gold chains or free thinkers. As a wheel on its axis turns, this book unwitting to itself around the idea of the Whitman. Helen of Sparta, of Troy, in Egypt, of no known address, of no known nationality, refugee of no known conflict, stateless, without property, disappearing under a veil of treason. I am not the virgin mother lamenting in the hills above Ephesus. I am the invective, injuring these dry plains studded with stone pines. I am the lateral commemorate of war. As the steps up to my hiding place suggest, I am the birther of sacrifice, received back into the earth, heavenly rock face. If you knew my real name, you would not use it so lightly. Helen as a beam of moonlight caught sideways. Helen refracted onto thresholds, her reflection a holy cult of high-born women yululating in bedrooms, gripping the mirror hard that bears her standard. Helen with beauty like a tightened bow. The window clapping shut like an iron gate. She does the latch, empty, diffuse glow. Now focus on her lithe and loathed silhouette. See if it makes plain how a woman could be mistaken by so many men for a ghost, bartered dead by nudist song, even in this unacknowledged light at this impossible angle. So we'll shift from Homer to Goethe. <clears throat> Um, and as Belgina said, um, 
this book uh, is, is a response, of course, to, to Goethe's Faust in part, um, but also uh, weaves in quite a lot of personal um, history uh, to do with partition, the partition of India and my family's uh, experiences uh, through that and also farming. Um, and I was very interested in thinking about um, that line, uh, that tracking that lineage from Punjab to England to the United States, so across the sort of three continents of my experience. Um, and there's, so there's a fair few poems in the book that, um, that refer directly to aspects of Goethe's Faust, but also poems about the experiences of partition uh, in my grandparents' generation, um, but also to the, the cultivation, the very specific cultivation of the wheat crop. Uh, because in sort of the 1960s, there was a, 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 a very important moment for Punjab specifically as the breadbasket of India, which was the Green Revolution, um, where suddenly uh, seeds that were manufactured and developed by the United States government um, in Mexico were then distributed across uh, places in the world where there was a fear that communism was going to take over. So this was their like soft way of combating that. Um, and so my family got hold of these seeds and their wheat yields went up considerably. Um, but the long story of the Green Revolution is it seemed like a really good idea at the time to have more um, wheat. But what actually goes into making um, that, which is increased fertilizers, pesticide, water, the diminishing of the water table, uh, debt, uh, the technology, all of the things that come after that really make it seem like it wasn't such a great idea after all. Anyway, so I'll just read through some of these poems. I'd be but a shadow, seed of clay, turned earth, blown onto the path of shadow. Want or indigence, debt, or shame, sisters of distress, whose midnight phone calls light the bedside lamps. You take the coverlet with you to the next room, care, sister of death, whose grief is not an abstraction, but an inheritance, a waiting for, another dawn, a being with, sisters, sageless arrows of grief. We rain down our fury, the devil whistles while he works. I am the fifth sister whose striving lays an ocean between the shadows of our dead, quarreling shores a great distance apart. Here is your image, a swan unfolding its wings, a river of blood down its back, its beak preening at arterial speed, red feathers, foaming, unstopping flow. We cross a mudded field of apples. In its dwindling harvest, a circle of blonde heads, murmurous, clutching arms, crouched webwork of ground. What magic is this? A conspiracy of daughters casting in daylight, red and white, making sacrifice of abject girlhood, how have we come to be here, sister? The autumn banks, the exile of a grass-laid river. If I drew a line through all our births over five centuries, from the Silk Road to the Satloj, through the woolly Khyber, its dark resin wending towards Lahore, pockets of carved stones, at one end would be the seed, ferrous, imbricate hybrid, yellowing thorn of wheat. At the other distance, the June waking, the July waking, to inedible sheaves, to age, to our hair falling out, our eyes clouding with disease, and the children that keep on never coming. Father, wild logic scythe in hand, barefoot, harvesting all night, high on opium. <clears throat> you ride the elevator to the 11th floor of a hotel, the tallest in our seaside town, pale yellow or coral or white, no lighthouse but an abrasive plinth chartered to the shore by cement. 
Holy fathers, beatified men, their bronze or wooden statues dot the coast from San Diego to San Francisco, up El Camino Real, where curved poles topped by soundless bells hang like sickles. A river, a mission, a chapel, its garden. An ocean, a boardwalk, mountains, a freeway. The town's Franciscan priest, Junipero Serra, once had his hands doused with red paint. Genocidal churches, arable lands. A museum with pieces of or whole Chumash bulls and other poorly handled things. School children appraise them. It is an annual ritual. You request a room overlooking the Pacific. The elevator does not stop. The hotel is never full. A wooden pier, once of remarkable length, extends towards the Channel Islands, draped in fog, reachable by boat, if you wake with the fishermen before dawn. A novel was set in those islands about the sole inhabitant of San Nicolas. The facts are, a native woman, alone for 18 years, spotted on the beach skinning a seal, hauled ashore to the mission where dysentery killed her and her language off. She was given a Christian name. We read it in school, but remember nothing except the word Aleutian and a numbness sharpened by no response. It was written by a descendant of Sir Walter Scott. Scott was, among other things, an early translator of Goethe. Dear sister, what you have learned is a dying craft. The elevator opens onto a quiver of directions. You drift back to a rose garden, a small women's college, where each girl is permitted to pick and take all the roses she can carry back to her room. The pier battered by storms is rebuilt, a catafalque decked in American flags from sternum to navel. From this angle, the sea is a parade of elbow-length satin. Excavating the cave of the lone woman at San Nicolas, diggers were halted by the navy. It lies half dug, disputed, full of sand, making distress calls. You run towards the end of the pier with your arms open, lodging in its sights like a gale or a target. The room's ceiling is shot white powder liable to yellow and stain. Someone later recalled seeing you taking in the view from your balcony. The sun is flattening into the sea, and below there are families fishing or striding in the dimming orange light. It is well beyond happy hour in the tiki-themed bar, the seafood restaurant we thought was so sophisticated. There's a revolving ballroom long since closed, where high schools held their proms. Corsages, rented limos, hairspray, saliva drying on gums in windy sunroofs. The sun is a gold disc over the gray-blue waters of the Pacific. To strive, you think, to know. You've brought with you a copy of Faust. What is it to want to know everything? The light sharpens to a point to a full stop to an ingot of gold at 7.30 p.m., this alchemy. Do you open Faust? Do you leave it in the dingy room on the beige bedspread, a wager of its own in our Eden, this Arcadia? Faust strip of coastline, a paradise built in his dotage, unbegun but in his imagination, an inner light. Now you remember everything. You are in a state of sudden alertness. You find your aim, you strive. There is the sun blinding all the summer day. There is the cliff where Euphorion dropped into blackness, marching heroic. You think of the roses and how you carried them all in your arms, striding full of hope into another century, to want, to owe, to feel shame. Dear sister, 
To wish to know everything Faust says, you must become nothing. Mephistopheles says, to extend beyond what is human, you must become the spirit of eternal negation. Faust says, you must be willing to die, but I am not afraid to die. Mephistopheles says, I will root your indentured soul from an eye, an ear, a navel, a fingernail, for the jaws of hell are always open. Faust, love has waded through my many dreams and orchestrations. Mephistopheles opines, we are all girls in another century bearing our arms in an inhabited garden, care slips through the keyhole like smoke, a kind of being without, a kind of alchemy. Faust, you will never fall where love can be seen from a great height rising above these hills like a memorable star. Kernels of Rain or seeds of rain is how raindrops translate, so that even the rain is not itself when you wait mouth open, looking skeptical, or just pulling at the dry earth with broken lips. Who will plant the rain in a hearse so that the moon blooms from his heart? Grandfather laid out and burnt like a stoic length of chafe, his mind a prophecy of smoke, Two rupees in his breast pocket and a slip of white, neatly folded, with his son's address on it. Smoke that is not rain nor wheat, but leans into them both like a fever unmatched by the living. There, he says, in a blue of white, that is all you ever needed to know about wheat. The wheat came apart in her hands. Her hands came apart in the grass, her body a field, the field her body. Innumerable hands would bury, carry the charge, the imprisoned lightning of her name. By soft coincidence, by a chance crossing of wild river grasses, by seizing threshing seeding, by training the eye on green, green, wild, soft unfolding, the seasonal miracle named by its naked composition, its durability also female, by sowing and harvesting, incidentally, women give shape, by burning off its chafe, by haploid shedding its goat face, stricken by no word, for spring only weather, coincidence of chance, the periodic flight from the sun's long shadow by a known path, which is why you take your elders with you, or else lose your way. I'll just read one more from Faust and then finish with a different poem. <clears throat> I'll read the last poem. It begins with a little dialogue between Faust and Mephistopheles. Faust, what happens now? Mephistopheles, direct your strivings downward. Follow the river, sisters. Follow the beasts who walk the threshing circle, doomed, blind beside the man who put out their eyes. Follow the mist sacred ground, the bad coin of fear inverted, to the last home we would ever know. As Belgina mentioned as well in her introduction, um, there's a, an essay here on miscarriage, um, and it is in three parts, and it ends with a poem. So I'll just end with the poem. A world gone quiet must be this fact, for which there is no precise language. The monitor goes off, and you are led past a succession of mothers to a room marked empty. Taxonomies of grief elude the non-mother, the unmothered, the anything but this fact. No face, no teeth, no eyes, or balled up fists to light the dark with a particular breathing. A black lamp beats its wings ashore. In the dark there is breathing. After five visits to the hospital, the bruising of inner elbows stitching themselves to themselves in obsolescence, the nurses stop saying, sorry for your loss. I may come to miss these laminated hallways, 
I know my way there to the artifact of losing. Loosened from the factual world into a silence where there is no grave but your own self stumbling from floor to ceiling without an inch of your life or mine or this particular absence. The Lancastrian nurse is matter of fact. Her metaphors are agrarian, the language of slaughter. If you start bleeding like a stuck pig, under those thick white fingers, an ancestry of collapsing valves and bleating transfigure into notes. You look familiar. Why have you come here again to my door with your metaphors of slaughter? A folder, yellow, the word baby on its cover, refiled as miscellaneous. What grew in you is not you, but a shroud, and any idiot knows a shroud. A ghost who wakes up five times a night stands undecided between rooms, shivering in its thin shadow. I know my way here to the language of loss. My grandmother, who died giving birth, explains what makes carnelians so red. I assumed it was the iron in its veins that made the Romans stamp their profiles onto its brittle clots, pulse of empire. Don't say that I never visited you. A ghost is as good a family as you may get. Ba, itni bad tusi aehe. After all this time, you finally come. The child that clawed towards you, sorry, that clawed you towards death is my kin. His bones are a line pressed into the earth you never wanted to cross, transfigured on the back of a convoy somewhere else. It must be this fact. A village and its farms and its wells on an ordinary day in August, smell of blood and panic, carrying a child from this and that disease whose death is on your hands. You look familiar. Why have you come here? Blighted or to blight, what gives up, gives over, is absorbed back into itself like a harp gone quiet, imperceptibly, in the night. Yeah, nobody thought to pair us up, but I, um, I read your book and I read your scholarship and your interviews and essays, and I thought, gosh, we should have been having a conversation <laughs> for many years uh, publicly. <laughs> We've been doing that privately. Yes. Yeah, well, <laughs> I would like to um, start by talking a bit about all three of your books. I offered a kind of a rainbow arch yes. in my introduction uh, because the first book is this highly experimental family narrative with um, a choir of mythological and literary voices. And then the second book is also highly experimental, rewriting of one woman's story, but then also, of course, Helen of Troy is also many women. Yes. And then this third book, um, most recent book, just a fresh, fresh <laughs> arrival, is it the first reading from it? Yes. Yes, great. So um, this book is a return to a family story. And again, highly experimental. Uh, father and grandfather at the center. Helen comes back from Eidolon <laughs> to, marry, Helen, yeah. <laughs> to marry the striving Faust. Um, and um, then all of this mythological, feudal, patriarchal language of progeny and primogeniture that you use so much in the uh, first two books and in the first part of the Faust, all of it erupts into the second part of the Faust with these poems, heartbreaking and fierce poems of miscarriage. Um, and um, writing these three books, you moved between continents, mm -hmm. you moved between traditions. And so I want to ask you this big question about the kind of artistic and intellectual effort that went into the leaps between these three very connected books. I wonder what does the Marble Orchard think of Faust? 
And what does Faust say to the Marble Orchard? And we know that the US government is listening there because Helen is on the phone all the time. <laughs> And this is, of course, being recorded. Um, yeah, no, that's a really great question. And I mean, you've, you've, I think you've drawn a lot uh, between the books that, that I wouldn't necessarily have, have done myself, which, of course, um, is, is brilliant. Um, I think that, you know, as I said, The Marble Orchard is, a, I think, like lots of poets' first books, it's, it's the kind of book where you, you, know, you kind of plod along. And I was doing a creative writing MA at the time. Um, but actually, it, it's another 10 years after the creative writing MA, I think, that that book was published. So it was a, you know, it, it for me is like a, a, a very long period of, of really trying to understand and come to a particular kind of craft, though I hate to use the word craft because it's so loaded, um, and a finding of voice. And a, you and use a, a lot of loaded of, words. It's, okay. <laughs> it's true. I do. Um, and a kind of um, experimenting with different voices. Um, but uh, I think with Eidolon, um, and it, it makes me think of um, something that, uh, that the, the rock musician Tori Amos says about her first album, which is um, at, that like the first album, she took all of her clothes off, and then her second album, she had to put them all back on again. And it felt very much like with Eidolon, it was like, like you know, I, I've done that now. And so I, instead of putting my own clothes on, decided to try on various costumes. Um, and Helen of Troy was great because, well, it was very flattering, obviously, for oneself to dress oneself as <laughs> Helen. But, um, but, you know, a multiplicity of Helens and thinking about the ways in which women are scapegoated for lots of other reasons. I mean, they did not go to war over the most beautiful woman on earth being abducted. Um, you know, it, it, there were lots of better reasons for, that, for it to happen, but it's such a great story. Um, and, you know, in the various afterlives of Helen, um, she's kind of constantly, uh, I, I guess, kind of not making excuses, but trying to uh, legitimize her existence um, as an individual, as, as a person, as someone who has feelings. And she is just used by various men um, all up until, you know, the 20th century. Um, and so I've, I wanted to get back to the kind of female story there. And I suppose you're right that in the first book that happens too. But I guess the main difference is that... Um, in the subsequent books, I'm not interested in um, thinking about personal history in a, in a direct way, whereas I think I do in the first book, but only because it hadn't really occurred to me that I should do anything else. Um, he referred to the essay that I wrote, um, Still Not a British Subject, which is, I think, pretty scathing about the ways in which poets of color in Britain are expected to reproduce um, a kind of... Um, very melancholic, nostalgic, um, lack of belonging. Um, and this happens again and again throughout the generations. Even poor British poets, you know, who, poets of color who were born in England are expected to use all sorts of methods to, um, to highlight their difference. And, and I wasn't interested in doing that, so I had to find other ways, I think. And I think going back to the classics for me, whether that's the actual classics of Homer and the Greeks, um, or to Goethe was a way of pushing that material through a sort of sieve. Um, and it, it animates the literary side of my brain and the sort of more scholarly side as well. Mm -hmm. the, the two books that... Oh, you're going to help me? Oh, okay. Nobody heard any of that. Great. No, they did. <laughs> Thank you. I heard it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, you heard everything, right? You can hear as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to, um, uh, to, to stay here with the 20th century reclaiming of uh, Helen. Mm. You started mention, mentioning um, uh, your, your scholarship and the, the two books that come in very strongly in Eidolon are HD's Helen in Egypt yes. and uh, Krista Wolf's Cassandra. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and then in Faust, obviously, there's uh, Goethe's um, if we cannot call it, uh, what did you call the Homer classics? Yeah, we'll just call it a masterpiece. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> got this masterpiece. So your work is always full of uh, quotes and other voices, classical authors, uh, contemporary authors, a lot of avant-garde women authors. They're also your research subjects. You work in their archives. Uh, but you're also an avant-garde artist yourself. And I wonder how these two 
occup how these two occupations, but perhaps you do not think of them as two different occupations. Mm. Um, how does, why is it not enough to just work in the archive? Why is it not enough to just write a poetry book? Yeah. What makes you feel that neither is enough? Why is it important? that these women that you research in the archives, whose collected poems you publish, whose biographies you write, why is it important that also they speak in your poetry books? Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, why is it important also for you as a poet to put in uh, essays in the book, into your books? Because the, your books have, um, uh, have essays in them. Yeah. So I, I wonder how... Uh, yeah. Is it one thing for you? Yeah, How does yeah. that work? Yes, yeah, so the, that's a good, uh, great question. So the relationship between the kind of the poet and I guess the scholar um, is one that uh, I, I suppose, I mean, I began first as a poet and, and really mm -hmm. that was, you know, the, the, the literary kind of um, critical side of things came later and it was, I think it was probably out of a sense of, um, Actually, I don't know why, but I'm, I'm trying to think of a good reason. Um, but I think the relationship between them for me is very fluid. And as you say, that there are essays in, in the two books, the two later books, um, which uh, the Sunday Times reviewer said was windy, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> I'm a windy academic. Um, but, but it was interesting because his point was, you know, it's like, like the windy academic couldn't bear to bring down the scaffolding. And I thought, well, actually, yeah, that's true. But, you know, why should we take the scaffolding down? Why can't it be there? Why should it be that this, you know, piece of art that we've produced, um, you know, that we don't see the supports, we don't see that the labor, we don't mm -hmm. set it into a context in some way. Um, and that what annoys, one of the many things that annoys me about lyric poetry is, I think this kind of sense that, um, that there is this pure and original thought and expression of emotion that takes place in some kind of reality that's reproducible. Um, whereas for me, I'm like, no, you know, we, we exist in this ongoing conversation. We're writing about other writers. You know, literature is made of literature, um, as well as other kind of whatever personal things. Um, so for me, it just feels natural to transgress those those kind of genre boundaries. Um, and for example, the, the the miscarriage sequence begins with a, a critical essay because for me, it was sort of wanting to find and research other writers. Um, but then moves into lyric essay, moves into a poem, and I like that setup very much um, because it accesses different registers. It requires different kinds of skills slightly, but ultimately you're always sort of getting into the same, I think, the same um, territory, mm -hmm. which is to think about language and to think about the ways in which language is produced and produces us. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And you know, I really was so moved by the second part, uh, the central part of Faust, with these two essays. The second one in three parts and the third part is a poem. But the first, uh, the first essay mm. is um, about Ulysses syndrome, yeah. um, which is this uh, stress-induced disorder in migrants, striving-induced, we could say striving-induced disorder in migrants, Ulysses syndrome. And uh, you talk about a friend, I think you read a poem in which she appears, a friend who committed a suicide because she was tired of striving. And with her, I learn in this essay, the thing that she had with her in that last moment was Goethe's Faust. Yeah. Um, and then you give your reading of um, the character of Faust and the relationship between Faust and Mephistopheles um, as a tragedy of development, mm -hmm. you say, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, a tragedy that, of development that can be uh, looked from the point of view of uh, economic development mm -hmm. and also imperial development, imperial figure that appropriates land for an imagined project yeah. that is both a project of philanthropy and a project of um, avarice. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but then this essay, um, which I enjoy reading so much, is followed by another essay. So we're in the middle of a poetry book. And another essay comes, An Uncommon Language, it's called. And I um, gullibly think, well, this is going to be also something about uh, migrants and languages um, and um, 
well, something like that, right? Something about imperial languages, maybe, why not? But it's, in fact, an essay about miscarriage. Um, and, uh, and then slowly, because I'm not very fast, slowly I understand that, of course, a miscarriage is a kind of a tragedy of development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a very, very different kind. And it's, I found that discovery so striking, my own self-discovery, yeah? Because then I could <laughs> see how you contextualize um, the, this idea of um, miscarriage, the, not an idea, but how we see it as the failure of striving too, because migrants strives so that migrants' children could have a better life. And so we're invited to, to read this um, poems of miscarriage also in the context mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. essay about striving. Yeah. A striving and failing, but then also, of course, your book is dedicated to your daughter, um, which in a way finishes the book, even though it, the dedication opens mm -hmm. um, the book. And, but then this essay on miscarriage, it ends on your own poem. And that's the end of uh, part two. Mm. Uh, it's quite amazing. I wonder if you could say anything about how you think of form of form here, um, why, for example, why not to separate the poem mm -hmm. and then follow with some essays? Um, or why not finish, have a part with just essays and then put a poem separately with poems? Mm. But I, of course, you, you heard me talk in, how, about how much I discovered through this form, mm. but, and you all set it up. And I want you to just confirm that my reading is right. <laughs> <laughs> I want you. <laughs> well, hundred percent correct. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this. Um, you know, speaking of triptychs, I think that the, the the triptych that I I had seen in my own work was a bit like the essay at Uncommon Language, um, which was really just a, a riff off, of course, of. Um, uh, Adrian Rich's um, sort of common language, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of kind of women having this sort of, you know, this, this language in which they speak to each other. And then for me thinking, well, there was the language of grief um, is very established along certain lines. There are many writers that we think of when we think about particular kinds of grief, but this miscarriage as an idea seemed to me like the kind of language that didn't um, have an established way of speaking about something that never fails to live um, and therefore cannot die um, to an extent. But then in my research, which was where I kind of began um, in this process, finding those women's voices that do write about it in various ways um, was the first part. And then the second part is a kind of lyric essay, I guess, um, which is, um, yeah, a kind of somehow a kind of mix between the two, doesn't use citation, doesn't use quotation, doesn't refer to other writers, uh, but isn't a poem proper. And then the kind of lyricizing of that um, at the end um, is, I suppose, a way of, of getting towards an idea of that personal grief through finding a language for it. So I couldn't have found the language for that last poem if I hadn't gone through both the scholarly route, the kind of the lyric essay, and in, in, in expounding something that felt communal, and then arriving at that sort of experience. Um, but the, the, the triptych that I think of more, I suppose, in my work is um, a pamphlet that I did with Banu Kapil and Nisha Ramaya, um, Bono Keppel may be known to some of you. Um, and it's, uh, it began as a conversation, really, about Bonnie's work, about partition, which is one of her major subjects. Um, and we just did a kind of conversation. But I began thinking about the lyric and how, for me, the lyric space creates the context of violence uh, for, pe for people of color who have to kind of inhabit this space where the expectation is. Um, that the presumed universality of the lyric subject means that they have to create difference, they have to other themselves, they have to treat themselves as objects within the, the space of the lyric. Um, and so then Bono and I kind of created this piece where I wrote a kind of critical essay and then we did a collaborative poem. Um, and that kind of, yeah, that sort of bringing together of different ways of approaching an idea is mm -hmm. why it's so useful to me. I could not write a book of just poems. Um, now, uh, because I just would find that so unsatisfactory and also so contradictory, given my dislike of the lyric. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
but you have, I love all of your lyrical moments in all three books and in your interviews and in the intonation when you read. Um, and, but also speaking of that kind of collaborative writing and um, um, I want to say something about translation and about the way you read Faust. Mm -hmm. You read Faust in Louis Magnus's tr translation. Mm -hmm. That was and, one of them. Yeah, that's an Irish poet who serendipitously mm -hmm. was in Punjab during partition and yep. he was making documentaries. Yep about the end of Raj. And, um, and so you're looking for that gaze in his translation mm -hmm. as you read mm -hmm. Faust, which I, I felt very fascinating because um, the whole idea of Faust as a migrant was such a revelation to me. Mm. I, uh, I love F Faust, but I would not say Goethe's Faust. Neither of us read Goethe in the original. So um, I read Faust in Boris Pasternak's mm -hmm. Russian right. translation. And I read Faust in that context. For me, Faust is always uh, a scholar and artist, but in a totalitarian state. And uh, um, so he, uh, if he doesn't want to be Faust, he has to become a migrant. He has to leave. Otherwise, he has to sell his soul <laughs> to the devil, which is the state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so like Andrei Sakharov is a great example of a 20th century Faust. For our young friends, Andrei Sakharov um, <laughs> was, was a Soviet scientist who created the thermonuclear bomb uh, for the Soviet state. And um, then he realized what he did and wanted his soul back. And <laughs> so the, <laughs> he got the Nobel Peace Prize for asking for his soul back. But uh, the Soviet government did not return his soul to him. <laughs> so. Um, I, uh, I wondered then about, um, uh, because there are some young poets here, and I wonder about uh, an artist in uh, the American empire, yep. a young artist who also wants knowledge and glory mm -hmm. and um, has a lot of imagined projects. Um, mm. So, um, I wonder who is, because the, in the Anglophone world, devil is not the state. Um, who is the Mephistopheles? Mm. Who, who should an American poet or a British poet watch out for? Yeah, so, uh, yeah it's a good question. Um, I mean, I think what interested me particularly about Goethe's version is that because it's kind of being written in this moment of the Enlightenment and um, there's a sort of, there are previous examples that Goethe is working from. He, as a young boy, would have seen the puppet plays that were produced. It was an urban, like, legend. It was a myth. It was kind of written in various forms. Um, and obviously his, his uh, Faust is only one of the many famous versions that we read. But what I really like about um, his version is that um, both parts, in different ways, because it's in two parts, um, give us a kind of sense of, of what the devil can be, what the devil becomes. Because I guess, you know, in Goethe's day, it still was the case that the devil, you know, was a kind of like guy with, you know, a goat feet and, and could kind of create all kinds of mischief and, um, and uh, yeah, terrible um, uh, temptations. But I think once we move into a time where God is also being questioned as we get further into the 19th and 20th centuries, the devil ceases to be a physical object, um, a physical person, um, but it becomes internal, both internal, psychological, um, but also, I think, part of the state. I think part of this sort of wider system. So it's both systemic and it's both internal, this idea of evil. And I'm very interested in evil. I'm very interested in evil, particularly in our time now. We're on like our fifth prime minister in, in a month, I think, in Britain. Um, so, you know, not to say that she's evil, but I'm glad she's gone. Um, but I think that there is a sort of sense of uh, uh, terrible um, doubt and fear and this, you know, the, this, this sense of the, the, the rise of fascism that's always been there, of course. Um, and so I think that the, I think the state is 
uh, something that we would perhaps think of in that sense of, of how the devil has been transmuted through this tragedy of development, Marshall Berman's phrase, and, and various other forms of tragedy. For the young artist who strives, um, I think that uh, you know, Faust may be a kind of, or thinking about the devil rather, uh, might be thinking about capitalism, might be thinking about the state and the ways in which it infringes in a totalitarian way on our everyday lives, whether or not we're willing to uh, recognize it and acknowledge it or fight against it. I think in a sense, the failure to fight against it is also an acceptance of a certain kind of evil um, that we have to kind of stomach and, and move through our day. Um, so I think, yeah, capitalism, I think is a good, <laughs> always a good, um, mm -hmm. but, I, but I think also governments. I think, I think this, the, the willingness to suspend our understanding of everything that is happening, even environmentally, which is a big part of the book, thinking about ecological crisis um, in a very specific context, but more broadly, um, and our willingness to do that, our willingness to, to carry on and pretend like it isn't happening. Well, I'm carrying on and pretending that several people are not pointing at their watches. Uh, time is the devil. <laughs> oh think, my gosh! <laughs> I think we're supposed to finish. We, I, we have only touched the um, tip of the iceberg, that is my questions to you. <laughs> and um, nobody else gets to um, ask any questions in public. <laughs> But you know what? My face was paraded um, <laughs> on, on campus for this event, so I got to ask the questions. <laughs> but you, um, you will get to ask the questions upstairs in the English lounge. Sandeep's books are here, all three. All three are here. Please uh, come and get them and um, get them signed upstairs and have a glass of something there. Sparkling water. Oh, sparkling, sparkling water. water. <laughs> We're surrounded by devils, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have a glass of sparkling water upstairs. Thank you so much, Sandy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.